Yeah, we've got the recording. Correct. So um, I'd like to welcome you all to the next uh, webinar uh, on dealing with stress, a homeopathic approach. Stress is a major uh, subject today with all, with all this going on with the lockdown. The two speakers we have now are Harula and Beth. Harula is the uh, is the Dean and the VP of Academics and Student Affairs at the Ontario College of Homeopathic Medicines. She's passionate about teaching people follow a holistic lifestyle and she's a lifelong student. <laughs> Beth uh, is a homeopath for the last 20 years. She's the head of homeopathy at the Ontario College of Homeopathic Medicine. She specializes in ADHD and she helps children and their families get over and heal themselves with homeopathy and alternative systems of medicine. Uh, with a short introduction, I'd like to pass on the mic to Harula and she'll take over the meeting from now. Okay. It's wonderful. Thank you so Bye. much. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for that great introduction. Indeed, as stress has been on top of mind for everyone these days, I'm going to begin this discussion with the scientific perspective of what stress does to us. And Beth will follow that with recommendations, especially from a uh, homeopathic perspective on managing stress, dealing with stress, both acute and, and chronically. Um, stress is the way we respond to our environment and that can look like many different things for people and we're going to to talk about that in this conversation um, but let's start with in a stressful situation it, when we're worried about loved ones worried about having lost our jobs uh, worried about health concerns and triggers these mental emotional reactions can in fact uh, and do in fact propagate a cascade of reactions in the body that lead to physiological changes. Prolonged anxiety and fear and anger perpetrate reactions that have a negative long-term health outcome. And we see that with our patients all the time. A stressful situation can uh, incur a fight or flight reaction in the body. And this is an evolutionary response that we're very familiar with. It is a response that is involved in the innate or instinctual survival mechanism that comes to us. And this is a response that helps us react quickly in life-threatening situations. When it becomes a problem, however, is when the stress is perpetuated and we're constantly in that fight or flight state. Um, as a cascade of reactions, you know, th this, this happens very quickly and it allows us to be in this fight or flight state um, because we feel as though perhaps we're in a state of attack and it's this stress that can be difficult for our bodies to assimilate. Uh, a little bit of stress is normal and it's okay. We do need that mild stress in our lives to you know propagate some sort of action at times or to um, stimulate us to uh, function optimally but when we go into long lasting stress it creates that fight or flight reaction on a longer term and that is what is difficult for our bodies to handle uh, we can overreact, our bodies can overreact, and over time this overreaction can be difficult. It can lead to pathological changes like high blood pressure, anxiety, and depression, not to mention addiction to substances like drugs and alcohol, as well as obesity from overeating. Sorry, the, the slide is stuck. Oh. 
So the stress reaction begins in the brain. What we see in the environment around us is what elicits a reaction in the brain. The amygdala is, is a part of the brain that senses our immediate environment. It senses that there's a threat to, uh, to, of danger and it sends a distress signal to the hypothalamus which then stimulates a cascade of reactions throughout our body. This area of the brain functions like a command center and it communicates with the rest of the body through both nervous and endocrine responses. And the purpose is so that we have this energy to fight or flee a stressful situation. The first, there are two major stress responses that our body initiates. The first one is a hormonal response where a hormone called epinephrine or adrenaline is released into the bloodstream and that brings about other physiological changes. So what happens? When adrenaline is released into our body, we have an increased heart rate. The blood moves from our internal organs to the periphery so that we can physically either fight or flight. Um, it, it moves to, the blood moves to the most vital organs for a situation, for a dangerous situation, including your muscles and your heart. It dilates the uh, blood vessels in the lungs so that we can absorb more oxygen readily. And this increases alertness. All of our senses become sharper so that we can respond to the environment around us in a safe way. The circulating epinephrine, it triggers the release of fats and sugar from the temporary stores, and it provides more energy for us to be able to deal with the stress response accordingly. The second stress response that our body is involved in is called the HPA axis response. And this response is uh, a slightly different one than the first. It is an initial surge, uh, the initial surge of epinephrine. Once that subsides, the HPA response or the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis response then takes over. It is a set of interactions between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, and the adrenal glands, which are glands that sit on top of the kidneys. These are hormone secreting glands of the nervous and endocrine system that initiate uh, a, a different stress response than the, in the one we just discussed. Unfortunately, this is not working. The HPA access is in the synergy between these organs, uh, this is an in neuroendocrine system that controls the stress response and regulates the, many of our body's processes, including digestion and the immune system, as well as our moods, emotions, and energy. So this hypothalamic pituitary axis response, um, it starts with the release of corticotropin releasing factor from the hypothalamus. When this binds to the receptors on the anterior, anterior, anterior pituitary gland, um, adrenocorticotropic hormone is released. This hormone then binds to the adrenal cortex of the adrenal glands, and it stimulates the, re the release of cortisol. This set of reactions keeps the body in a high alert state. As the threat, the stressful threat passes, Cortisol leaves and eventually falls. And this is called a negative feedback loop. That is when the body returns back to a normal state. So how does this happen and how does it stop? As a response to stressors, it'll continue for several hours after the initial stress has been um, felt by the body. And at high enough concentrations, the cortisol exerts a negative feedback on the hypothalamic release of the CF CRF and the pituitary release of the hormone. So it balances out once again, once those cortisol levels are at a level that um, is, is an overflow for the system. So the body then needs to respond to that. 
With continued exposure to stress and with repeated exposure to stress and therefore activation of the HPA axis, one uh, is more prone to the development of physical pathologies because our bodies are consistently stimulated. With this persistent surge of uh, hormones in our body, we can see the damage of blood vessels and arteries, increased blood pressure, and it can put one at risk of heart disease or heart attacks and strokes. Consistently elevated cortisol levels contributes to increased appetite and obesity and a constant state of anxiety. So what can we do? Well, we can do a number of things to try and reduce the stress that's around us. We can limit exposure to social media, which is very stress provoking these days. Meditate and exercise, deep breathing. There are many different supplements that can be incorporated into one's diet that have a calming effect like B-complex vitamins or magnesium as a mineral. Uh, caffeine can be decreased and we can increase the um, intake of fruits and vegetables. Of course, sleep and social support at this time is difficult. And homeopathy, which is the mainstay of everything that we do. So at this time, I'm going to pass it on to Beth, who is gonna talk about homeopathy. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> thanks, Harula, and thanks again to Kartik for um, inviting us to join you today. Um, I want to talk about stress uh, with you from the homeopathic perspective, now that you've gotten a sort of a grounding on the physiolog uh, what happens physiologically. Uh, stress is a really vague term, and as such is one that we really discourage, certainly our students from using, and even our patients when they come in saying, we're stressed. We try to encourage them to get past that uh, language um, of everyday communication and really zero in onto the into the individual expression of, of what is going on with them. Uh, people tend to use terms like stress, like depressed, like anxious, um, as very blanket terms that actually once you start working with a homeopathic repertory uh, and with homeopathic remedies doesn't really mean a lot. So what we try to do is really understand what everybody's individual um, experience is. And of course, this is really what the job of homeopathy is. The job of homeopathy is to understand individuality, to understand individual expression and individual reaction um, of, of many, many situations both physiological and emotional. <clears throat> we seem to be having uh, trouble moving our slides along. So stress can be a code word or a blanket word or a vague term for fear. Likewise, it can be a blanket term or a vague term for anger. And moving on, it can be, stress can be anxiety. And stress, whoops, can be, uh, okay, we're really struggling here. So stress can be depression or sadness or a whole host of other emotional states. None of which, even though more specific perhaps than stress, are sufficiently precise enough or individualized enough for the purpose of understanding a patient from a homeopathic perspective. In understanding any emotional state from a homeopathic perspective, we need to understand a number of factors, including the trigger to that state as well as the reaction to that state. Uh, so the causation and the reaction to any kind of stressful state can uh, vary dramatically. And this is part of the process of individualization and the un understanding a totality of symptoms for every individual patient that uh, we look at and use in a homeopathic intake. Excuse 
use the uh, pauses here. I'm trying to keep our, our slides seem to be getting stuck and not moving along with us. I'll, while the slide is coming in, uh, oh no, okay. So uh, what I was going to say is that um, in working with children, I found that this understanding of dividing understanding of emotional state from causative factors to reactive factors is a really useful way of understanding behaviors. Lots of behaviors that would look similar from one child to another. I could differentiate uh, between enormously. Once I started understanding what is it that brings along this behavior, and then once I know the trigger, what is the a reaction to that trigger? And looking for fine uh, granulated differences between those. And that has become something that I think is really important to understand um, and we teach in our understanding of any emotional state. So I'm going to spend a little time looking at uh, acute stress. And I am using as an example for acute stress the uh, realities of today's uh, isolation, the fear of illness that we're all witnessing, kind of this worldwide pandemic has really created another pandemic of stress of sorts. So throughout this, I refer to it as sort of COVID stress. And that is in quotations, largely because what we're talking about is uh, a, an acute stress situation. And I will sort of tailor my conversation and understanding to the way people are reacting, responding to the COVID situation uh, around the world, but it's not particular or unique to COVID. So some causative factors for stress in today's COVID uh, climate are the stress of being alone, being fully isolated, being separated from loved ones. Conversely, there are other people who have are in small apartments with too many people and no space to themselves, no privacy, no ability for quiet, for stillness. Likewise, there are some people who have much too much time on their hands. They don't have work right now. They don't have a purpose in life. Other people seem to have much too much to do, and it, I think it depends on work. I've observed that most people I know either have much less work than they do normally or much more work than they do normally, both of which are stressful situations. We need life balance. Having too much to do not an, um, is, is not good and not having enough to do or a purpose in life creates stress. Of course, the fear of illness, the fear of contagion um, is a huge stressor. Lots of people have an enormous amount of anxiety about the future. None of us really know how this is going to play itself out. None of us really know what the future will look like. Um, and, and that creates a lot of stress for people. Uh, failing relationships is an issue, creating stress. And again, this has to do with too much time together, not enough time together. Disappointment over lost dreams, canceled events, the things that keep us going, the things that keep us uh, looking forward to the future, those uh, vacations, those times with family, the special events. We've had a canceled wedding in our family. Those all create a certain amount of stress. Financial concerns is a huge part of the um, situational stress of uh, the present day. Businesses are closing. People are losing jobs. Um, too many people to take care of. Uh, being overwhelmed. My colleagues, um, including Harula, who have lots of small children at home and are also trying to work and have elderly parents as well, it's an awful lot of uh, stress on anybody's, uh, it's a lot of work on anybody's plate, which creates a lot of stress. Fear for loved ones. I know other people who have loved ones who are frontline workers. There's a lot of fear for them. And there's also a lot of conversation and uh, discussion about how things are being managed. And everybody's uncomfortable with the present situation to a greater or lesser extent. And a lot of us have ideas of how we might prefer to see, see things managed. And that too, that feeling of powerlessness creates stress. So there are also a number of reactions to those causes for stress. Some of the reactions to stress can be rage, they can be aggression. 
sleeplessness, nightmares, irritability with family members, lots of crying, weeping, uh, controlling behaviors, trying to really take control of a situation that feels out of control is not an uncommon uh, re response to stress. There are somatic physical reactions, so the physical reactions to stress, obsessive cleaning, fear of people, anxiety around people. It's very um, disconcerting watching people on the street, crossing the street as you approach. That fear um, is, a re is, is an understandable stress response. Self-medicating with alcohol, with recreational drugs, with food, with screen time are also um, other uh, reactions to stress. Restlessness and the ability to relax and this constant feeling of agitation is another response. Theorizing, thinking about it, you know, scouring the news, trying to make sense of things. These are just a few of the reactions to the stress that we're all living under. And it, it's a good exercise to sort of spend a little time thinking, what is it about the situation that creates stress in me? And what are my reactions to this stress? It's a good exercise for self-knowing. And it's also a good exercise if you're a practicing homeopath for starting to understand the variation of expression of this dynamic in your own patients. So I'm going to, um, when my slides catch up with me, here we go. Look at a few remedies for what I'm calling COVID stress. COVID stress, once again, being shorthand for acute, short-lived, or uh, stress that has to do with a particular set of present circumstances. So the very, very first remedy that I think of for uh, COVID stress is aconite. Aconite is the first remedy to use for panic attacks, for sudden, overwhelming fear with extreme restlessness. People who need aconite have this unaccountable fear that comes with palpitations, uh, tingling in the extremities, hyperventilation. Many of these physical responses can be explained by the physiological uh, 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 events that Harula described earlier. People needing aconite have panic in a crowd. They fear to go out in a crowd. This should sound very familiar for people living through the time of COVID. They have fear, they have a presentiment of death. I also want to add that in this time of COVID, aconite is a remedy that many consider um, uh, the remedy that will nip the illness in the bud. And I would recommend taking aconite on the first indication of any incipient illness, particularly at this time. So the very first sign of a little sore throat, um, anything like that, I would suggest that you do take uh, aconite. It's interesting to me where we see both the physiological logical and the emotional come together and aconite's a really good example. We're seeing both the physiological a start of perhaps viral illness uh, accompanied by um, a stress or mental emotional situation that really is quite typical of this day and age. So I suggest uh, the use of aconite 200 in this instance. In all cases, whatever remedy you have on the shelf is the best potency. But if you have choice, um, Aconite 200 would be the potency I would go for in this case. Next, I want to talk about the remedy Arsenicum for acute COVID stress. Arsenicum presents with great anxiety about illness, about contagion, with a tendency to exaggerate symptoms. Uh, that tendency to exaggerate symptoms perhaps comes from this desperate need for reassurance. The sicker I am, the more I might get some assurance. Um, there's also an obsessive attention to cleanliness and orderliness. Um, people needing arsenicum um, are tremendously cautious. They take no risks. They're preoccupied with uh, death from illness, and they have a lot of anguish with those thoughts. They often get a lot of acute gastroenteritis with anxiety or fear and a tremendous amount of restlessness. 
it's not our recommendation to take this remedy or any remedy, other remedy, unless indicated by specific symptoms. That being said, a lot of homeopaths are using arsenicum um, as a homeoprophylactic or as a preventative remedy for COVID. I believe that it's presenting as a good possible preventative remedy for COVID because the mental emotional symptoms that I just went through, this fear of contagion, fear of illness, um, incredible uh, obsession with cleanliness and hand washing are part of the larger mental emotional scenario that encompasses this COVID um, illness. So um, I suggest using Arsenicum 200 when there is uh, these scenes, uh, these, this anxiety, but if there's illness in, around you and you really feel like you want to do a preventative remedy, one or two doses of arsenicum 200 couldn't hurt and may just well, may very well help. Moving on. Let's see. I'm, I apologize once again for these delays. That's the right one. I know that Brioni is coming up, but I can't see the slide. Here we are. Here's Brionia, Brionia for COVID stress. So um, Brionia is um, somebody who has an enormous amount of stress about money and business. So they talk and they worry incessantly about business. Um, people needing Bryonia are firmly rooted in the material world and they're sort of lost without that connection to the material world. They have a great fear of poverty and an enormous need for stability, for security, for safety. They're extremely irritable and they're anxious when feeling insecure sort of like the, the the angry bear I always think of Bryonia as. Um, there's a slow onset of viral illness with Bryonia. They desire to be perfectly still when they're unwell. They're worse for any movement and any of their pains are worse for motion. They have a thirst for large quantities of cold water. Um, they usually present with a bursting and crushing headache. Uh, they have a painful and violent cough that's felt throughout the entire head and chest. Uh, Bryonia is a very well-known flu remedy, and it's been strongly indicated in many viral cases and is being used a lot right now um, in this COVID pandemic. A lot of homeopaths are using Bryonia. So again, it's not surprising when a remedy that has a mental and emotional state that's so in keeping with the stresses that a particular illness brings on for that remedy to be useful in the physiological treatment of that illness. Okay, quick brief mention of Kofia. Of Kofia is another great remedy for acute uh, COVID stress. Uh, this is for people who are excitable, they're oversensitive, they're highly reactive, they're buzzing around, they're full of them and vigor. They look, they're like the people who've had too much coffee. Um, People who need insomnia, people who have insomnia uh, with an overactive mind often need co uh, cofia. They're waking with thoughts and they're in, um, in, in ideas. The brain is a buzz on the uh, slightest bit of noise. Um, they're sleepless at night, but they're sleepy during the day. And again, that's a man another manifestation of what I'm calling COVID stress. Gelsemium um, is a great remedy that has a strong feeling of apprehension and anticipatory anxiety and the inability to cope with new situations. Uh, Gelsemium presents with, a, with paralysis and the feeling of heaviness with an emotional burden and fright. 
They fear losing control. They desire to be quiet and they have a great aversion to being disturbed. They tend to tremble. They want to be held. They have a lot of paralysis with fright. Um, I remember being told that uh, Gelsemium is like the glass coffin. They can't move, but the mind is holding on to those things that they're, anxi they're anxious with. Um, they're sleepless um, with grief. The, as mentioned earlier, the mind can be alert, but the body's unable to respond. This is an excellent flu remedy with body aches, chills, uh, headaches, marked ability. That kind of body ache is a very common initial symptom for people who are just coming down with the very first stages of COVID. And it's also a great remedy for the acute symptoms of stress around uh, this COVID, around COVID. I want to mention the remedy, uh, Califos. Califos is a remedy for people who readily fall into a nervous state after any shock, strain, or excessive exhaustion. They have an inability to cope with um, everyday stresses um, and strains from school or from the workplace. They have a great irritability and despondency. They tend to be sleepless with their anxiety and worry. They have a strong emphasis, as all Cali remedies do, on right, wrong, morality, and duty. They lose self-control easily, and they enter into a state of prostration from worry and vexation. I've seen a lot of people um, in a Cali Foss state right now as they just feel their, their bodies are exhausted from the stress and this feeling that they cannot cope with what's going on around them. Uh, Califos can be uh, um, dosed in a tissue salt or a low potency remedy. Ignatia is another great remedy for COVID stress. Um, Ignatia has elements, whoopsie, <laughs> for uh, disappointment with uh, in grief and fright. Ignatia is the remedy that presents with silent grief, with a lot of sighing. They do not want to be consoled. They want to be left alone to just do their thing. They have a strong sense of duty. Um, they're reactive to criticism, and they'll have these quick emotional outbursts, which they quickly tamp down and control. There might be tears in the eyes, a bit of twitching around the mouth, um, biting of the lips to control that emotional outburst. These are people who tend to eat away at their stresses, so their appetites can be ravenous. And I know there's lots of talk of people saying, I'm just eating my way through this lockdown, eating my way through um, the uh, through isolation. They're putting in, and I'm putting on weight like there's no tomorrow. And Ignatia is a really good remedy to consider for that state. And the last remedy I want to talk about for um, a, acute COVID stress is Nux Vomica. Uh, Nux Vomica presents as irritable and impatient. These are the people who cannot tolerate waiting in line. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been spending a lot of time waiting in line these days. And if you see people just with steam pouring out of their ears as they're waiting in line, you, they, they, these may be people who need Nux Vomica. They have a strong aversion to any kind of restriction. And of course, really what's happening right now is we have a huge amount of unwanted restrictions being placed on us. These are people who are ambitious, they're driven, they're competitive, they cannot relax. And it's really hard to be like that when you can't work, when the, mark, when the economic uh, realities of the world are shut down. Um, at home, there'll be quarrels quarrelsome and at work actually they'll be quarrelsome abusive insulting and very controlling these are people who wake at three in the morning with a rush of ideas um, with thoughts they need to have a pad by the paper by the side of the bed so they can write down their brilliant thoughts and then they can't wake up in the morning uh, they have a strong craving for stimulants such as coffee and alcohol um, they need coffee to work and they need alcohol to fall asleep 
It's a great remedy for ailments from overconsumption. And um, judging by the number of bottles that I am seeing on my street on uh, days that we collect our recycling, I have a feeling that there's a lot of overconsumption going on. And there's probably a lot of people who are needing some Nux Vomica to get through uh, this, this time of COVID. Um, so it's a great remedy for rapid onset of high fever with marked irritability and the potency um, suggestion for Nux Vomica is a low potency. Now, I want to uh, move on at this point to talk about um, more chronic um, presentations of stress. All of the remedies that we've discussed up to now are remedies that can be used either in acute chronic state or in, a, or in a, an acute stress state, excuse me, or in a chronic stress state. I've described to you the acute state, but if the conditions that were described are conditions that have are not just particular to today, to the, to, to the situation we're facing right now, but are the way that people react or the triggers that people respond to over time, then those may very well be remedies that are useful for chronic stress. Virtually every remedy we know can be uh, used for chronic stress. Um, there is hardly a remedy that for which we have some sort of a mental emotional picture that wouldn't be applicable to this very broad and vague definition of stress. But it's obviously not possible for me to go through hundreds and hundreds of thousands of remedies with you right now. So I want to take a look at a few remedies and situations particular for chronic stress. The term acute is generally a term that's used for conditions that are two weeks or less. So a condition that stays on for a longer period than two weeks is often considered chronic. Now, I think that the, def the two week boundary is not really particularly appropriate because really what we're talking about is rather than acute stress, right? Acute stress is situational stress. And while that situational stress it has lasted. I mean, we have been in lockdown here in Canada for about six weeks now. Um, and so obviously we're gone well beyond that acute uh, boundary of uh, two weeks. It's still very much a situational um, uh, story. And the question will be, what will happen when the situation changes? Will the stress response that people have been uh, displaying under the uh, situational uh, constraints, will that stress response continue? Uh, obviously, we really hope that as the situation changes and the um, inconvenience and impact of isolation abates, that um, people will be able to and people start living a more normal life, that stress will lift. But for some people, these stresses or the long longstanding stresses of their previous life can have a permanent impact on their health and well-being. And again, excuse me while I wait for this to buffer and my the next slide to come up. So I um, took the title of this slide, When the Body Says No, from a book that I uh, am very, very fond of by Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, and what in this book, what um, Gabor Mate is doing is he's exploring the connection between stress and disease. So he looks at the impact of long term stress on the mental and emotional level, coupled with a physiological impact of the repeated 
hormonal cascades over time and the development of serious health concerns such as poor immunity, cancer, heart disease, and other serious chronic uh, diseases. Um, I highly recommend this book, and I highly recommend this book for patients for whom you are trying to convince of the imperative of changing circumstances and situations in their lives that cause long-term repetitive stress so that they can understand what the potential impact on their health might be of not being able to, of not changing their circumstances. Along with some of the lifestyle changes that uh, Harula mentioned earlier of exercise, meditation, um, eating healthfully, getting outside, and so on and so forth, homeopathy does have a really major role to play in the impact of chronic long-standing uh, stress of all sorts. In many ways, this sort of long-standing burden is exactly what Dr. Hahnemann was referring to when he was talking about dis-ease, the absence of ease in our life because of chronic, repetitive, long-standing long stress. And we'll get to the next slide in one second. Here we go. So when I talk to my patients about this impact of long-term stress, I have an analogy that I like to use. I call it the crushed flower analogy. So the I, I, I liken the organism, the healthy human organism, as a flower or, or a plant that's growing upright. It's growing towards the sun. Its you know, roots are going down into the earth. It's reaching towards the light, which we can see as a metaphor for hope and our future. And the burden of stress over time is the crushing of this plant over by a rock that falls on the flower, by a footstep that comes and stamp treads on that plant, um, perhaps breaking the stem, uh, redirecting the direction of growth, um, perhaps smothering its ability to get the sun it needs, um, thwarting its access to nutrients by grinding out some of the roots, and perhaps in the long term, killing the plant. And I see the job of homeopathy as one of gently removing that rock, nudging that rock aside, and allowing the organism to resume its rightful growth, its development, to be unimpeded in achieving the kind of health that it, we all have the capacity for. So a few remedies uh, uh, for, it says from, it should say for rock removal, also known as the impact of chronic stress. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to look at now. And again, once there are very few remedies that wouldn't in certain instances work um, for, uh, chron for helping people deal with chronic stress, but I only have time and space here to look at a few. Um, I want to look at the causative elements of stress in some of these remedies, but um, it, again, it's far from an exhaustive, exhaustive list in any case. So carcinocinum is the first remedy that I'd like to bring to your attention. So carcinocinum is good for patients who have spent most of their lives taking care and fulfilling the expectations and needs of others. These are the people pleasers. They're driven to success. They're perfectionists. They're overly sympathetic with the needs of other people. They usually um, have a history of domination, made demanding parents, dominating partners, or too much responsibility from a very young age. Um, I find that I have a lot of uh, patients who come in and tell me that from a very young age, they had to take care of either younger siblings, pretty much as the primary quote unquote adult in the room, 
or they had to take care of their parents, either because their parents were not emotionally competent or because their parents were unwell. And this kind of a uh, scenario in which you're constantly putting your own needs to the side and taking care of others and your entire upbringing can create a carcinous sign in a state. So often children, people needing uh, carcinous sign have had are products of very severe educations as well or environments in which whatever they do is not good enough. These are patients who have a enormous amount of self-control that's been well learned over their life. They have a strong sense of duty, which is almost overwhelming, leading to strong feelings of guilt. They have a history of prolonged fear or unhappiness, especially childhood feelings of neglect, of being unloved, unwanted, or being the only responsible adult in the room. They often have obsessive cleanliness, are very orderly, they're fastidious. It's almost as if they're trying to find or uh, control in an uncontrollable world. They often present with a chronic or prolonged insomnia, even in childhood. Now, many of you will know that patients who need carcinocinum are patients who have a strong history of cancer in their family, a personal history of cancer. They may have repeated febrile episodes or severe pre repre uh, presentations of uh, childhood infectious diseases occurring in adults. I see carcinocinum as a really important remedy for uh, changing that rock, rolling the rock off a flower that seems to be heading in the direction of possibly developing some cancerous pathology. So carcinocinum is a great remedy for long-term term stress caused by the situations that I just enumerated. Moving on to, oops. Well, we'll go to Orem next. So Orem, or the gold standard, Orem is, go is gold. So this is a remedy that is indicated for duty-bound, workaholic, industrious types who have, from childhood, this very strong drive to be the best. These are highly, highly ambitious people. They want to get to the very, very top. They're always busy, work is never complete or sufficient. They have underlying their busyness, um, feelings of neglecting a duty, anxiety of consciousness, a lot of guilt. Um, they are oversensitive to contradiction. You can never suggest to them that they do something differently or um, you, without getting sort of an explosive fit of anger or violence. They want you to appreciate them. They want you to respect and revere them, but they don't want to hear uh, any kind of criticism. Strong fear of failure because success and being the best is the only option for these people. Uh, they are depressive, they're melancholic, they have can tend to have a suicidal disposition. And of course, it makes sense that there's the method of suicide that they contemplate is throwing themselves up from the from a height. So they're at the top and they're gonna just throw themselves down uh, from that height because being at the height is taking a massive, massive toll on them in terms of chronic stress. Interestingly, this remedy has an affinity with diseases of the vascular system, the heart and bones too. So you can see that a life of being ambitious, of the stress of always being the best, of winning every race, of being the best in every class, of making the most money, of any, whatever it is, can create this incredibly stre chronic stressful uh, situation, which results in heart disease in many, many instances. I'm gonna take a quick look at the remedy Coculus. Coculus is um, a remedy that is very useful for ailments from long-term physical and emotional stress. So these are people who have often been up, they call it the night watching remedy. So there are people who have been up um, night after night after night, 
taking care of somebody, of a loved one who is sick. So they've been nursing the sick and they have an enormous amount of anxiety about the sick person. The caretakers of chronically ill people have an enormous burden of stress on them that becomes chronic, um, that becomes a chronic stress situation and can often lead to illness. In this case, it leads to extreme weakness. They can barely speak or stand. They are so weak. So it has an affinity with a sensorium, but also with a uh, cerebrospinal access and female sexual organs. So women who have um, uh, chronic issues um, with reproduction and people who have um, almost incipient paralysis along with long-term standing stress are often uh, need uh, of, of this nature, stress of this nature often uh, require uh, the remedy calculus. And I'm trying, whoopsie. There we go. I know there's one more here. Ah, Staphysagria. Excuse me. Staphysagria is the last remedy I want to talk to you about in terms of chronic stress. I hope that as I go through these remedies that you're uh, getting the understanding that each of these remedies present a very, very different picture of the sort of chronic long-standing uh, stress that over time can have an enormous impact on an organism. That flower is really crushed and it can be crushed by all sorts of things. It can be crushed by having to be a perfect child. It can be crushed by having to take care of other people. It can be crushed by the internal demands of being the best, of always being on top. And in this case, in the case of Staphysagria, it's crushed by mortification, humiliation, shame, punishment, and the um, ailments from those. So these are people who've had been put down um, and really it's a, a lot, talking a lot here about an abusive, emotionally abusive and often sexually abusive background. These are emotions The people who need this remedy have been suppressing their anger for their entire life because expressing their anger would get them into a more risky and more dangerous situation. They resign to their situation, but they also pity themselves. They've learned to be yielding, to be mild, to be timid because it is a safer posture for them to be in. They're easily offended. They're sensitive to rudeness. They accept authority to an extreme degree. Again, this is a self-protective posture that over time is very, very, very unhealthy. They stay in relationships for fear of conflict, for fear of anger. They have an enormous amount of losing self-control, of voicing their anger, of letting that suppressed anger come out. And often when it does come out, it comes out in, in a misdirected way. So this would be the woman who has a very um, emotionally abusive marriage, has learned to keep her mouth shut, has learned to accept what comes her way, yet she'll have road rage when somebody passes her on the highway. Um, so it's her anger bubbling up, but bubbling up, not really where the anger uh, at the, sor the appropriate source of the anger. As mentioned before, there's often a history of abuse, especially sexual abuse. And um, I said that this is an excellent remedy for any invasive wound. And uh, that is true on a physical level for any incision or invasive wound, but it's also the first remedy that I would think of for any woman who's been raped. Um, and of course, that's probably the most invasive wound uh, that we can think of. Um, so uh, there is an affinity to the nerves, uh, to the genital uh, urinary tract um, uh, and, and staphysagria. 
So I'm going to wrap up um, here. And um, Harula and I are more than happy uh, to take any questions that you may have at this point. Um, I'm hoping that we've been able to give you a little depiction of what happens within the body on an endocrine and hormonal level when uh, there is uh, a, a lot of stress, when we can look at what happens for the acute stress of today's era and also take a look, a little short look at long-term or chronic stress. Um, so we welcome any questions that you may have. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and open yourselves, uh, open your video so we can see you. Or um, please um, put some questions into the um, into the uh, chat. Uh, somebody's asked if we're willing to share the slides. Yes, absolutely, not a problem. Um, and please ask us any questions you may have. Okay. How about stress caused by social phobias um, was asked. Sure, I mean, there is an endless number of stress that's caused, um, an endless number of sources of stress. So again, social phobia or, uh, you know, is another great example. And so if you have somebody who's in, who, who says, comes into your office and says, you know, I have a lot of uh, social phobias, what the first question would be asked, give me some situations. What is it? What's going on? Describe those situations. So it could be that there are situations where you're afraid, what is going on? Are you afraid of what people are gonna think of you? Or are you afraid that you're not going to look a certain way? Are you afraid that people are going to have an opinion of you? Are you afraid that you're going to stutter and not be able to express yourself? There's an endless number of expressions and reactions to any one of these situations. But 100% uh, homeopathy is, is really effective in addressing social phobias um, and fears of all sorts. Um, and yes, of course, the fear of being in, in society, the fear of what you might do or how you might react in a social situation is an incredibly stressful situation that whittles away at people's self-esteem over time and is something that responds really well to homeopathic treatment. Adrenal fatigue, is there a specific remedy you recommend? My honest answer to that question is I generally uh, use uh, supplements for people with chronic adrenal fatigue. Uh, the Cali Foss uh, remedy, tissue salt that I mentioned earlier is a great is great for adrenal fatigue and I highly recommend it. I also like rhodiola and ashwagandha. Uh, those are both uh, great supplements for adrenal fatigue. And yes, we can share the slide PowerPoint. Anyone else? Angry Bears Bryonia. You're welcome. Comes from internal restlessness. How about stress that comes as that? It, 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 that is an expression. That's a reaction. So earlier, when I discussed this distinction between triggers and reactions, internal restlessness is a great reaction to a stressful situation. And what we would want to know is what is it that's causing that internal, that, that reaction? What are the situations and the circumstances? So we would try to find a remedy that both matches the causation 
as well as the expression, the expression being uh, internal restlessness. So this is a question, the condition now of people becoming fearful of other people, also fear with stuff coming onto the doorstep, but it is necessary to be careful to keep distance with people and suspect every single thing, calculate our action, but how to balance this condition on the long run, in, in, in the long run. I think this is um, very, this is a little bit of what I was talking about when I said our hope is that when conditions change, when uh, isolation and uh, this this the situation of COVID, which is a, causes situational stress, when that changes, that people will stop being suspicious of people, stop being afraid of germs, stop being afraid of getting uh, sick from everybody and everything. Some people won't. Some people will be stuck in a chronic state of stress as a result of this situation. And those people will need um, some kind of long-term, uh, well, not long-term homeopathic care. They'll need some homeopathic care or they'll respond well to homeopathic care. The hope is that most people will uh, react um, that as, as the situation, the situational causes of the acute stress are removed, that they will slowly get back into a state, not of dis-ease, but a state of ease. But for those people who are stuck in a permanent state of dis-ease or disease, we need to take care of them and we have the capacity to do so. Um, somebody's asked, can we use metarinum as a block remover? Um, I would be very cautious about using metarinum for anything, unless it was indicated by a totality of symptoms, mental, emotional, physical, and uh, family, genetic. Um, metarinum is a great remedy. It is a huge, um, it, it, it is a, a very important nose note, but um, it needs to be used with caution and not used um, just sort of as an acute, it rarely, if ever, is it used as an acute remedy. And so unless there was a strong indication for the use of that remedy, I would not suggest using it. Will you want to take over? Uh, there was, uh, uh, sorry, there was a question about, not a question, but a comment about using, uh, sorry, gargling salt water and, and using some other things for what is happening right now. And I think that's a great idea. We do have so many solutions on our hands, not just one thing. Um, you know, in my family, we do use supplements. We do use uh, nutrition very heavily and common sense. So if you're feeling a tickle in the throat, for example, absolutely. The salt water gargle is amazing. Oregano oil is fantastic. There are uh, garlic, garlic as a herb and, and in the diet is wonderful. Turmeric, I know a lot of um, the, a lot of cultures use many spices in their foods and that is wonderful because that is what, you know, it, it heats us up, it warms us up and keeps um, viruses and bacteria at bay. And at the end of the day, I do have to say that as we become cautious in this environment, I think it's also important to remember that as healthy living organisms, what makes up our immunity are viruses and bacteria. And not, you know, we we do have to be cautious, but we, we shouldn't necessarily be afraid. Like our bodies are strong. And if we take care of our bodies and take care of one another, we can keep in mind that we have the ability to heal. And we see this as homeopaths every day. When we give a remedy, it's not the remedy that is healing the patient. It's a stimulus to the patient's body to remind them of what their bodies are capable of. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to use homeopathy, but let's also remember that we have traditional medicines that we've been using for for, for so, so long, and our, our cultures um, 
support that in a very big way, and this is a great time to remember that. Great. Uh, Beth, the, um, Linda would, would like to ask, uh, some homeopaths suggest 200C for emotional issues. Are you in agreement with this? I am not in agreement with any sort of blanket uh, answer to potency. I think that potency is determined by a large number of factors. Um, I personally tend to use lower potencies for chronic situations to begin with, to see how a patient responds, and then I'm willing to go up from there. I prefer for chronic situations a water dose of a lower potency on a more more frequent dosing, and then I go up in potency, reducing frequency, increasing potency. Is how I tend to work with chronic situations. So there is this idea that mental emotional symptoms respond better to higher potencies and physical symptoms respond better to lower potencies i think the answer is that your accuracy of remedy and your assurance that you've got the, a good remedy is a factor the vitality of the patient the vitality of the illness are all factors that need to be taken into consideration over time um, even in dealing with this present acute illness, um, there are a lot of people saying 1M, 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 and I'm finding that some of the people I've been treating want 30s, and they respond better to 30s. And your job and as a homeopath is to uh, zero in on what potency is most appropriate for your patient it's part of the process of individualization and go from there. For home prescribers, I would say that having a mixture of 30s and 200s in your cabinet is a great uh, way of going. If you don't, as a home prescriber, see any response to one or two repetitions of a 30, chances are the remedy does not, is not the right remedy. And I'd rather see you play around with a 30 than play around with a 200. And if you're finding that the patient, whoever that may be, if you're home prescribing, member of your family, is responding to the 30, but the action of the 30 is not holding, then go up to a 200. Can you explain the aphorism of 291 of the Organon of Medicine with regards to the life life vital force from weak situations how is it mentioned to bathe with water of 25 degrees 27 this this should be uh 27 degrees centigrade i would think Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 20 unless you wanted the wind ball ice bath <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, regards to life, life, vital force from weak situation. Hula, can you help me here? Sorry, I don't. I don't see the question. Um, um, can you explain? Uh, uh, I'm not sure what it's asking. Regards. To, um, Which one is it? I'm I'm num the one about uh or I uh, offers him two nine one. I, I can't quite under make out the question. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, 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 Dr. Ragini would like to know whether citrus fruits, vitamin C, can also be included to boost our immunity. Absolutely, oh. vitamin C is amazing. It reduces the oxidative stress in the body. Vitamin C is fantastic, and uh, in terms of dosage, you know, if we're treating for viral or bacterial infections, I think we need to go quite high. And quite high means that, you know, in any one dose, a patient, an adult, can handle 2,000 milligrams um, at any given time, and any given dose. That's all we can absorb. So we can space that out over the day to all the way up to bowel tolerance. And that can be 6,000, 8,000 milligrams per day for some people. Um, and it's a wonderful way of supplementing for what is happening right now. Also, there was a question about sepia being used as a chronic remedy. Absolutely. 
if the condition calls for CP on a mental emotional state, as well as the circumstances around that patient to be using sepia for chronic stress, it will absolutely help, especially with the mothers that are overwhelmed with work, having the children at home, um, you know, with the responsibilities of running a household and working and being parents and taking care of our parents. Uh, all this makes a CPO woman indifferent and makes her frustrated and angry. Yes, CPO will absolutely help in a, in, in a situation like that. Yeah. We have a question, so but I, inhalers and nebulizers can be quit within three to four days depending upon on the severity of the case. Um, yes. Um, also a note about ascorbic acid, sorry to, to get back on that topic. Yes, you're right, ascorbic acid is not the same as vitamin C, it needs to be buffered. So a liposomal, for example, vitamin C is so much more effective. Uh, I don't know who is going to be eating that many oranges to, to, to get that vitamin C content, but if we can get a buffered C, then that would be ideal. Or a C from a uh, a C from a food source, so kamu kamu, or an ester C, or an, a C from berries. Uh, those are all much better. Definitely stay away from ascorbic acid. You're better off just eating oranges. Um, the real benefit of the liposomal C is the way it breaks down in the belly. Um, it's absorbed readily. Larger amounts are absorbed without causing bowel uh, discomfort. Um, Influenzinum, is it able to fight COVID-19? Um, I've not seen any evidence of influenzinum working. Um, the conversations and the uh, uh, discussion boards that I've been a part of, uh, influenzinum has not been a regularly uh, recommended uh, homeoprophylactic for uh, this uh, illness. Um, so I would not necessarily uh, recommend it. Okay, let's see. We have a long answer here. Oh, okay. This is uh, the Forism 291. <laughs> there we go. Sixth edition. Thank you. Right. Uh, the, the benefit of, of, of a lukewarm bath. Yes. Right. Great. Yeah, does anybody else have anything to ask uh, speakers? I'm sorry, yeah. I can't. I can't under. I can't make sense of the uh, Luke. The the the. It's really a lukewarm bath. It's almost a cool bath, um, yeah. and I, 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 I'm not able to answer um, the benefit of uh, of doing that. I certainly know I wouldn't enjoy it myself, but um, <laughs> I can't answer that for the medical benefit of doing that. I'm sorry. All right. Is, could it be as in relation to fever? Maybe in relation to fever. Right. Uh, I think uh, we're done with all the, questions. all the questions. Yes. And I'd like to thank uh, Beth and Harula for this wonderful seminar. You talked about the acute stress and the long-term stress that comes in and how it can impact us and all the remedies that uh, can help us with stress. I'd like to thank all the participants too who have stayed with us. And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Bahola Laboratories, Bahola Labs, uh, manufacturing homeopathic medicines since 1939. You can get their medicines online at www.bahola.co. So I think with this, we'll end uh, the seminar. We hope to have you again. Beth and Harula. It'd thank be our you. pleasure. Thank you so much, Kartik. Yes, thank you for inviting us, and we'd love to come again. So, um, are you able, Kartik, to just um, take the PowerPoint presentation from the upload?